10 bags of human body parts have been discovered in public bins in London. It's a very sick, disturbing thing for someone to do. Metropolitan Police have launched a murder inquiry and believe there's a serial killer on the loose. Dismembering people is not a clean business. Forensics must act fast to find evidence of the killer at the crime scene. Every killer leaves a trace. It's up to us to find that trace. While searching for food in waste bins, a homeless man has discovered butchered body parts concealed in bin liners. The bin and the surrounding area are quickly cordoned off as a crime scene. Sarah Thurkle has over 25 years' experience in crime scene investigation and is one of the UK's leading forensic trainers. Searching a public bin outside a block of flats is a forensic nightmare. This is probably one of the worst forensically preserved crime scenes that you can have because of the location of the bins, the fact that they're outside, everyone's got access to them and people are dumping rubbish in them. London homicide detective Brian Hook was one of the first on the scene. When a homicide happens, that golden hour is all important. If it goes wrong in that hour, it stays wrong. Inside the bin bags, Police discover a pair of human calf muscles and a female torso. CSIs meticulously search the bin and its contents for any clues as to what has happened. Well, every single one of those bags has to be opened and every single content has to be assessed. As a crime scene coordinator, I'd be expected by an SIO to put forward hypotheses and decisions about future scenes that we might encounter. My understanding for this case is that the bins are the dump site. They're not going to be the main crime scene. The main crime scene is either going to be the area where the body's been cut up, um, but also potentially where the bodies have been murdered. Be on the list of items that I would put on my forensic strategy of things that potentially we would be looking for. Saws, knives, all sorts of equipment, along with black bin bags. Police make inquiries with the residents of the flats who use the communal bins. Every crime scene's a challenge. The challenge here, there are hundreds and hundreds of flats. One of those flats could be our crime scene. Remember, it's vital that at the earliest opportunity we find where our victim was murdered and where the dismemberment took place, because there'll be a wealth of forensic evidence there. Day two, with no active leads to the killer and potentially more than one victim, the case is declared a Category A murder investigation. There is a, a sudden increase uh, of activity. The curve goes steeply up. All sorts of things are going on. We've got specialist search teams on the way. The inquiry team is making its way into homicide headquarters. The specific officers for house to house, CCTV, seized at the earliest opportunity. Within hours, the search team make another horrific discovery, less than 250 metres away from the first deposition site. And it was in this area here, in Plender Street, that the specialist search officers actually found another bin liner that it also contained body parts. Finding who these victims were is of paramount importance. Your DNA profile will take 24 hours to 36 hours minimum. The body parts are sent away for DNA analysis and the pathologist confirms the detective's suspicions. At this point, it was actually realised that we had more than one victim. They have the torso of one female and the limbs from another. The Metropolitan Police have a serial killer on the loose. The whole enormity of what had actually been found suddenly hits you. This is going to be a momentous investigation. 
Fearing the killer may strike again, the detectives need to act fast. The communal bins are everywhere around here. Met Commander Andy Baker is brought in to oversee the investigation, and dozens more officers are called in to expedite the house-to-house -house inquiries. The house-to-house -house was extensive. On the face of it, a fairly mundane job, knocking on doors. Knowing what we know, though, it's quite scary to think that there's body parts found less than 20 yards away from where you live. And at the same time, you have to find out who lives there, making sure that you're checking that with what records show so they don't leave a person off who could be a suspect. Many of the residents suggest a man from the estate the detectives should speak to. It's obvious from the house-to-house -house inquiries that a lot of the neighbours and people that live on the estate have misgivings about one of the residents and his attitudes and sometimes his behaviour. The police now have a person of interest on their radar and the digital forensic team has an update regarding the CCTV. They had an image of a man in a long, dark coat wearing a baseball cap with a New York Yankees logo on it, opening the bin in Plender Street where body parts have been found and actually depositing a bin liner. Was someone from the local flats had taken the bin bags out from his flat and dumped them in the bins outside. The man is identified as local resident Anthony Hardy, the person brought to the officer's attention during the house-to-house -house inquiries. We now have somebody that we can look at far, far closer. Police pinpoint Hardy's flat on the estate. He lives in between both deposition sites. This is the back of the block where Hardy's flat is, which gives him easy access to these bins. When somebody becomes a person of interest and is edging towards being a suspect, the intelligence unit on the homicide team would do full background on them. Records reveal that just 11 months ago, police were called to Anthony Hardy's flat after a neighbour had accused him of criminal damage. While searching Hardy's flat, officers made a disturbing discovery. There was a bed up against one wall, and lying on the bed is the dead, naked body of a female. The woman was identified as 38-year-old Sally Rose White. Anthony Hardy was arrested on suspicion of murder. After the post-mortem, the Home Office pathologist gives a cause of death of natural causes. The victim had underlying health problems and health issues, one of which was heart problems. Once a pathologist says natural causes, uh, it virtually closes down that as a, a murder investigation. That was brought to our attention, and so was the Occupy. The police believe that this is more than a coincidence, and they must urgently apprehend Hardy team is assembled, they go to the premises, and the door is actually open, it's not locked. It had that mortuary smell. It's something that once you've experienced, you always recognise. Human body parts from two unknown victims have been discovered in public bins on a North London housing estate. Police have identified a suspect, 51-year-old Anthony Hardy. A specialist team has gathered out of sight of Hardy's ground floor flat. They are ready to force entry and arrest him on suspicion of two murders. What we have is a man that not 11 months previously had a dead body in, it, in the flat, not 150 yards away from this scene where we found dismembered body parts. For evidential purposes, an officer records the events. They open the door and they're greeted with a corridor. There are drawings and paintings on the floor and on the hallway walls. It can only be described as bizarre. And it's fairly obvious at this point, Mr Hardy is not there, but there is a distinctive odour within the premises. As you go right into the sitting room, 
you're greeted with a dining table. By the dining room table, there are actually three televisions connected to three VHS video recorders. And on the table are multitudes of VHS cassettes. There was stacks and stacks and stacks of um, videos, a sadomasochistic, violent, um, hardcore porn. I remember seeing a red devil's mask on the wall opposite. Gave you that sh kind of shudder when you looked at it. There is a distinctive smell coming from the bedroom. The door to the bedroom is opened. Um, not only does the odour get stronger, but on the floor next to the bed is an object covered by a black local authority bin liner. And lying on top is a hacksaw and a number of knives laid neatly, almost halter-like. Unfortunately, underneath there, what we discover is the torso of a female. The police now have two torsos, but there is still no sign of their prime suspect. Hardy's not there. Where are we most likely to find him? We are now dealing with a manhunt. The flat is secured as a crime scene, and harvesting forensic evidence becomes the priority. My understanding is that it was a very disturbing scene within there. This is where there's a there would be a discussion with the crime scene coordinator and the SIO as to what actually they want us to do at the scene. What's the forensic strategy? You could spend weeks and weeks proving everything at a vast cost when actually only examining a few items will prove beyond reasonable doubt that this is your offender and this is where he's committed the crimes. My priorities would be identification of the females, identification of the tools and the bin bags. Following the forensic strategy, the torso is taken for a post-mortem examination and the tools are sent for analysis. To prove if a weapon has been used, scientists need to find trace evidence of the victim and the suspect. Examining the hacksaw blade, you'd be looking for evidence of DNA on the teeth of the hacksaw, bone or any fragments of blood or uh, tissue to be able to tie this hacksaw to any of the victims in the dismemberment. To dismember a body with a hacksaw needs a lot of force, so you would be looking on the frame of the hacksaw for any fingerprint evidence where the hacksaw has been pushed down. Any fingerprints that are recovered from the hacksaw frame would be submitted to the National Fingerprint Database to see if there's any matches on any known offenders. The swab samples are sent to the lab to see if they match a profile on the National DNA Database. The post-mortem report confirms that the torso found in Hardy's bedroom matches to some of the limbs recovered from the first two crime scenes. The pathologist has also made a discovery on the torso, what could provide a breakthrough in confirming the victim's identity he has extracted cosmetic implants. The clinic that did the procedure was actually in Germany. And we know that because the clinic actually, on the implants, had a unique reference number for each and every implant that they made and inserted. So they were able to actually give us the patient's details. The serial numbers identify 29-year-old Elizabeth Fallad. She was a lady who had fallen upon hard times, had drifted into drugs and alcohol. Further investigation reveals that Elizabeth worked as a high-class escort. That she had worked in Chelsea, in those kind of areas, Mayfair. But sadly, her dependency on drugs um, had really kind of lowered how she earned her living. Now that you have a victim, you now have a direction you can go in. You can look at their lifestyle, where she frequents. You can now talk to people that she knows, that know her. Elizabeth's vulnerabilities 
led her to London's red light district, King's Cross. I suppose in the old days at King's Cross, I'd have been stopped by now for circling, wouldn't I? This is a totally and utterly different neighbourhood now to what it was in those days in 2002. It had a reputation, quite rightly, for, for vice, for prostitution. Unfortunately, sex workers are vulnerable because of the life they lead. And it's really crucial to get that victimology. The history of that victim could inform you of how they came to sadly meet their death. There's variation in the literature looking at why serial offenders commit murders. Um, one possible um, explanation is that there is a sexual nature. Sex workers are an easy target for Anthony Hardy. He lived in an area where lots of them work so that he can engage with them without arousing suspicion from others. Whilst the manhunt for Hardy continues, the results from the hacksaw tests are in. The fingerprints found on the frame match back to Anthony Hardy, and there's a mixed DNA profile found on the blade. Part of the profile matches back to Elizabeth Vallad, and the other matches to the torso found at the first bin site. This profile is run through the National DNA Database, and there is a match. We identified Bridget McClelland. She was a mother from central England. Again, sex worker history. Somebody has to be brought to book for it. And you've been handed a very important thing, which is to speak for them. You're working for them, you're working for their family. And it's your job, it's the team's job. You are now their voice. It's a huge responsibility. Detectives have confirmed the identity and backgrounds of both victims. We still have to prove that it was Hardy that has done this terrible deed to both of them. And what we're looking for now is where those paths crossed with Hardy. The knowledge of the victims and their circumstances assist the forensic psychiatrists who continue to build a profile of Anthony Hardy. There appeared to be a stark contrast to his earlier stage of his life compared to his current stage before. He appeared to be living a very conventional life. He was a graduate. He had a stable full-time job. He had a marriage. When the whole family moved to Australia in the 1980s, his wife first started reporting changes in his behavior. Major life events, such as moving to another location, may be precursors or triggers for reacting in different ways and for um, behaving in different ways. He attacked his wife with a bottle of water that was frozen, so effectively was, was a solid lump, um, and then dragged her into the bathroom and tried to drown her. Um, the frozen bottle of water is an indication of the manipulative cunningness that is emerging within Mr. Hardy, because once that is done, obviously there would perhaps be a search for a murder weapon. And what you would only have is a, a bottle of water or even an empty plastic bottle. Hardy returned to the UK following the end of his marriage and his life continued to spiral out of control. There's a possibility that Anthony Hardy uh, exhibited a, a sensitivity towards women and negative emotionality towards women, particularly after the breakup of the marriage. So it was at this stage that there appeared to be a deterioration in his mental health. He was no longer employed. He was moving from hostel to hostel. He became an alcoholic. Hardy's history reveals a continuum of violence and indicates the high level of danger he poses. In 1981, he was involved in a serious assault with the attempted murder of his wife. In 1982, the kidnap of his wife. In the late 1990s, violent and intimidating behavior towards others. In 1998, indecent assault and sexual assault. He was uh, arrested and suspected for uh, three rapes of th you know, three separate women. They didn't end up at court for a variety of reasons. Um, so, 
there are precursors there. Hardy's timeline of violence takes investigators up to the discovery of Sally Rose White's body in his flat in January 2002. What we now have is a violent man that not 11 months previously had a dead body in, it, in the flat, not 150 yards away from this scene where we found dismembered body parts. If sexual offenders are not apprehended and they continue to carry out their crimes, they may increase their appetite for certain facets and aspects of those crimes. It appears from the evidence that Anthony Hardy felt internally, intrinsically compelled to behave in these ways and wasn't able to stop himself from doing so. The hunt for Hardy intensifies whilst the forensic team continue to look for potential evidence in the flat. They discover a roll of black bin liners located on Hardy's desk. These are sent to the lab for tests. Bin bags are really interesting because you can link bin bags to rolls of bin bags. Forensics may be able to prove that the bags found at the flat are from the same roll as the bags containing the women's body parts, which would further implicate Hardy. So the bin bags that were used to wrap the body parts in have uh, unique markings on them, striation marks and manufacturing marks. And also they have marks where they've been pulled off a roll. If you compare bin bags by looking at the individual perforations and seeing what matches under a microscope, you can determine whether they've come from the same roll. So the bin bags that were used to wrap the body parts in come from the same roll. You make those connections from a forensic scientific perspective, then that is fact that you can present to the jury. Back at Scotland Yard, the digital forensic team are also making progress. One of the things that's looked at is what we call passive data. We all carry around with us loyalty cards that relate to different shops. The nice thing about those from an investigative perspective is it literally gives a time and a date of what is actually bought. The digital specialists extract the data from the Nectar card found inside Hardy's flat, and there are loyalty points earned from a purchase of bin liners made two weeks before the body parts were discovered. To corroborate this evidence, they analysed the supermarket CCTV. We found where the bin bags had been bought. Who was buying them? Harvey. Great evidence. Crucial that we get him buying those bin liners. Then the bin liners, in his hand, being put into the bin in Plender Street. All these different avenues, all these strands of investigation, and now starting to come together. To further strengthen the case against Hardy, the forensic team must confirm their suspicions that the murders and the dismemberments occurred in his flat. You cannot cut a human body up without getting blood everywhere. On that first walkthrough, there was no blood apparent, and we decided that we would lean on our forensic experts and say, what can we do? They came up with the state-of-the-art technology of Luminol. Police in London are hunting a serial killer. Their prime suspect, Anthony Hardy, has gone to ground, and they fear he may strike again. Forensics have control of his flat and continue to harvest evidence that links Hardy to the murders. The bin bags containing the body parts have been forensically matched to a roll found in Hardy's bedroom, and data extracted from his loyalty card combined with CCTV prove that he purchased them. Trace evidence of Hardy was found on a hacksaw, as well as the DNA from the two victims, Elizabeth Fallad and Bridget McLennan. Two days into the manhunt for Anthony Hardy, and there have been no sightings. We knew we were looking for a serial killer. We had descriptions of Anthony Hardy. He was a big man, well over six foot. Grey hair, beard, glasses, wore a long black leather coat. Was well known in the King's Cross area cafes. The urgency to apprehend Hardy drives detectives to utilise the media. One of the largest police investigations was launched as more body parts were found. Hardy was dubbed the Camden Ripper. 
a press named him as the Camden Ripper. So you're into Jack the Ripper kind of status. Some offenders strive to achieve the status of other well-known offenders, particularly serial murderers. It may be that they feel validated when they achieve public status in terms of their crimes. For Hardy to have been compared to someone like Jack the Ripper may have made him feel that he had accomplished something or done a thorough job in terms of his crime trajectory. By turning to the press, the investigation is now under further scrutiny from the public. The forensics are working tirelessly to prove that the murders and dismemberments occurred inside Hardy's North London flat. What we must realise in relation to Mr Hardy, the very fact we had one of the victims actually in the flat sounds as if it's overwhelming evidence. In reality, it's not. He could have turned round and quite happily said, nothing to do with me. It was a third party. I'm not involved in any way, shape or form. We still have to prove he was involved. Obviously, the victims have been dismembered, but dismembering people is, is not a clean business. If the blood had been cleaned up, and we could find that, we could present that as evidence. To determine if there had been a clean-up of blood, the CSIs employ a breakthrough technique called luminol. Luminol is used for examining areas for blood traces. So if there's a suspicion that an area is being cleaned up, luminol will pick up traces of blood on surfaces. Luminol works by the mixture of two chemicals, sodium hydroxide, and hydrogen peroxide. Those two chemicals react with the iron that's in everybody's blood when the luminol is sprayed onto whatever surface you're looking to find out if it's had blood on it. There is that chemiluminescence that happens. Any traces of blood will react with the chemicals and glow in the dark in a bright blue colour. Certainly one of the things in this case you're looking to find areas that had been cleaned up. Sometimes the perpetrators take the victim into the bathroom because that's a place that can be easily cleaned down. So obviously the bathroom was an area that was going to be inspected. By the chemiluminescent glow, Luminol reveals there'd been an excessive amount of blood in the bath and on the bathroom floor. Also the door frame leading into the bathroom, the Luminol revealed that blood had been wiped from that location, which is perhaps an indication that something bearing blood or bleeding had been dragged along the floor into that bathroom. Despite a thorough cleanup, the luminal reveals that there was once a vast amount of blood in both Hardy's bedroom and bathroom. And all this is evidence. The more evidence you have, the bigger that wall of evidence, those bricks you can build up which will go towards, hopefully, a conviction. The forensics begin to build up a picture of the horrific acts that have happened at the crime scene, and they have documented further evidence that illustrates Hardy's sexually deviant interests. Anthony Hardy had very much personalised his flat with some quite standout details, such as vast amounts of pornographic material, there were images drawn on the walls. It's reported that there are satanic markings and slithers of dried skin and flesh on the wallpaper. He appears to have uh, satanic masks and devil masks. It may be that he ties this up with his compulsion for the sexual gratification. There's a lot of videos in there, pornographic material. From a forensic point of view, that's not really important for me to find his fingerprints on those videos because it's his videos in his flat. It's good intelligence, but it's not going to prove the murders. It's going to prove that the man's a bit weird, but it's not going to prove that he's murdered and dismembered girls. But for forensic psychiatrists, this sheds more light under Hardy's mindset and actions. All the evidence indicates that Anthony Hardy is a sadistic killer. Serious violent offenders of this kind fantasize and plan for the crime itself and engage in various rituals throughout the commission of the offense. It appears that Anthony Hardy is a very dangerous person and may, be, may pose a further risk to women in future. And you begin to build up a picture, but then you're thinking, it's a manhunt. Is he going to harm anyone else? With fears mounting that Hardy could strike again, 
the pressure is on the detectives to track him down and arrest him. Because we're now manhunting Mr. Hardy, his lifestyle, what he does, where he goes, is imperative to know every single detail. And one of the things that became apparent is he had some medical conditions. Police have learned that Hardy is a diabetic and will soon need to obtain more medication. It was obvious from what wasn't in the flat that the medication would be running out. He would at some point have to go to either a doctor or a hospital to seek further medication in the medical professional hospitals are all alerted to that fact. They're all supplied with photographs of him and details and contact numbers in case he came in. On New Year's Day, the mass circulation of Hardy's image provides the police a much needed lead. UCL Hospital contacted us uh, and thought that Mr. Hardy may well have visited them to pick up some medication. Officers go down there, look at the CCTV, and sure enough, yes, it's Mr. Hardy. He has shaved off his beard to try and change his appearance. Well, it did no good because the next day, the front page of every newspaper in London had the unshaven image, Mr. Hardy, on their front page. Detectives have their suspicions confirmed. Hardy is still in North London because Hardy had been here for, for some time and, and knew this area. It was his hunting ground. He's not going to stray far from this. I mean, that was something we were very, very aware of. You've still got one eye out, one little beady eye always on the footways, always on the pedestrians, just in case you come across him, in case you see him. 24 hours later, another sighting. An off-duty officer and his son see a man fitting the description of Anthony Hardy at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Uniform officers arrive at the location. There is a, a fight and the police officers that actually go in to make the arrest are actually injured. He attacked both officers. He fractured one officer's socket in his, and cheek. He stabbed another officer in the hand. They held on to him. After a three-day manhunt, the police finally have their suspect in custody. They have only 24 hours to compile all the evidence and charge him with the murders of Elizabeth Fallad and Bridget McLennan. As soon as he is taken to a police station, the clock under the Police and Criminal Evidence Act starts ticking. That's a green bin, Tony, with a black lid on it. Exactly the same as the one behind the pub. Do you know that bin at all? But what is said and not said by Mr Hardy is going to have an impact on what's happening within that crime scene and the decision-making process. The wrong decision, Mr Hardy gets to the end of the clock and he walks out without being charged. You can get extensions on custody time limits with superintendent's authority, but uh, the crime scene can change dramatically. It can s speed up quite a pace if someone's in custody because there might be vital evidence that the SIO needs to be able to charge an offender. He had a local representative under legal aid and he no comment. No comment, no comment, no comment, no comment, everything. Have you ever used that being Tony? No comment. Mr Hardy doesn't have to say anything to us. And if he doesn't answer any questions, then all you can present to the evidence is what you find. Because I'd suggest, I think I'm right in doing this, that the joss sticks, the burning of the scent, would have been to mask the smell. They don't want to be caught for murder. They want to say, it wasn't me. It could be someone else. My door was open. Anyone could have gone into that flat. Is that why he left his door unlocked? So he could say, loads of people used to come to my flat. He did have visitors. So was that how he was building his defence? Was he working on an alibi? I wasn't there. Everything had to be proved. As the custody time limit approaches, the police are about to unearth a compelling piece of evidence that could secure a murder charge. We're contacted by a friend of Mr Hardy who has possession of some photographs. These photographs have been taken by Mr Hardy and then actually given 
into a photographic studio to be developed. Mr. Hardy then, when he was on the run, gave the receipt to this gentleman and asked that they be recovered and held for him to recover. The digital forensic team retrieve the CCTV footage from the photo studio and cooperate that with the date and time stamp on the receipt. It was Anthony Hardy wearing the long leather coat and the New York Yankee hat he was wearing on his arrest. What the photographs revealed were our two victims. They were posed on the bed by the way the limbs were laying. The pathologist came to the opinion that the photographs were taken when the women in them were dead. It's a very sick, disturbing thing for someone to do, to take photographs of dead girls. Serial killers often keep mementos of some kind or take photographs of their victims in various positions. Having the mementos may serve as a reminder of what they have achieved. Normally, the offender wants to leave the crime scene as soon as possible, but in crimes such as Anthony Hardy's, he wasn't ready to stop or to finish those acts of crime, and he wanted to prolong the enjoyment that he received from them. These photographs were able to link, firstly, the victims to the flat via background objects. There was a mask involved. This mask had been placed on their face, and this, again, is tied back to the mask being found at the scene. And there was also a baseball cap that the offender was seen on the CCTV wearing. We then are in a position where we have to prove Mr Hardy took these photographs. With time running out, the negatives are sent to forensics for analysis. Similarly to bin bags, film negatives can be forensically examined for unique striation marks. When a film is placed into a camera, the cogs within the camera will make unique markings on those perforations within the film. If you can tie that back to a specific camera, then you can do further forensic trace evidence searches on that camera to then look for DNA or fingerprints, which will then further link that camera to an offender. Please look through items seized from the flat, and one exhibit may prove to be a crucial piece of evidence. Scientifically, we can prove those negatives came from that camera. It's always fantastic sense of euphoria when you gain that little bit more evidence that eventually we began to get a full picture. With confirmation the photographs were taken by Hardy's camera, the incriminating evidence is put to him. And I'd like you to talk me through these exhibits. Like that, for instance. What's that do for you, Mr Hardy? After discovering body parts in bins, an extensive forensic investigation ensued, leading to the arrest of suspected serial killer, Anthony Hardy. Forensics have built up a wealth of evidence from three crime scenes. Luminol revealed areas of blood that had been cleaned up. Trace evidence of the suspect and victims was found on the hacksaw. Bin bags in the flat matched the bin bags containing the body parts. CCTV has shown some of Hardy's movements and now they have Hardy's camera and his photographs of the dead victims. These photographs were obviously paramount to the inquiry because they were able to tie the girls to the scene, to the mask, to the bed, to the suspect. I'd like you to talk me through these exhibits that I'm going to show you. Like that, for instance. What's that do for you, Mr Hardy? No comment. Anthony Hardy is confronted by this new evidence but still refuses to answer questions. That, Mr Hardy, is your flat, isn't it? No problem. The detectives now have another key piece of evidence against Hardy. His mementos provide yet another direct link to the crime scene, and the police can charge him with the murders of Elizabeth Vallad and Bridget McLennan. The team now has 10 months to prepare for trial. There is still huge amounts of work to do. We're looking for similar fact evidence um, is there any evidence in his past 
that he's done similar things before. We had witnesses come forward, um, other sex workers, and several of them actually said that, that whilst engaging in sex, um, he had let the whole of his weight bear down on their body and they, they would find it very difficult to breathe. We know that another female came forward and said that she was attacked by Anthony Hardy and she said, I couldn't speak because I could not breathe. It was like he was pushing me right down into the bed. I physically couldn't move and couldn't speak. He got a kick knowing I couldn't breathe. The most kick he got was at the point when I was literally not able to breathe and I was crushed in such a position. I think this indicates that Hardy genuinely received gratification from being in control of other women, restraining them in this way and having the power over their um, ability to move. It's a type of positional asphyxia. In other words, the diaphragm is not able to move and therefore you can't draw um, oxygen into your lungs and effectively suffocate. Uh, so that is a distinct possibility as, as a cause of death for our two victims. This new intelligence brings Hardy's background back into question. We went through other sex workers that had been murdered because they had to be put to him. Um, we had to get all the paperwork out of Sally Rose White's uh, investigation 18 months previously. The pathologist reviewed what he decided back then and came to the conclusion that Sally Rose White, in fact, it was asphyxiation by pressure. Bearing in mind, Sally Rose White was a very small woman. Um, this 22 stone man lean, just pressing into you uh, could have been a cause of death. A consultant forensic psychiatrist who assessed Hardy in 2003 suggested the following explanation. If the jury accept that the defendant did in fact intend to kill or seriously harm his three victims, then I believe the offending is linked to the defendant's sadistic personality, his intoxication with alcohol, and his rage at his sexual dysfunction. Police were determined to never allow Anthony Hardy to walk free again. We are working for our victims. If we get it wrong now, it stays wrong. It will always be wrong, and it'll still be wrong when we put the person in the dock at the Central Criminal Court charged with murder. He appeared at the Old Bailey. We went there with all the witnesses lined up, um, the neighbour who he had a dispute with, his history to show his kind of... Um, violent tendency. The masses of circumstantial and direct evidence against him. This was a really strong case. As the prosecution prepares to try Hardy for the three murders, he finally talks. He pleaded guilty. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Anthony Hardy admitted to being the Camden Ripper. He receives three life sentences for the murder of Elizabeth Fallad, Bridget McLennan and Sally Rose White and is later told he would never be released. Personally, I don't think we found all his victims. That's my opinion. No matter how good you are in an investigation, no matter how thorough you are, sometimes a little bit of luck comes your way. The witness that had reported finding the body parts was a homeless guy. If he decided that this was actually a lot of trouble and just walked on, then eventually those dustbins would have been emptied and we would never, ever have ever found those victims. Every single tragedy is, is, is not, it's not one event, is it? It's, it's a series of, of events. They're all generally unconnected, but they come together and, and create what happens. Um, and in this case, it's just tragedy, absolute tragedy. <laughs>